I want to welcome you all to the videotape room, American Broadcasting Company. I wish you could all come down here and see this uh, room in person while this demonstration is being put on. But uh, as you can see from the pictures, the room is just a little bit too small to accommodate this number of people. I will try to uh, explain some of our operation here, some of the uh, functions that take place, and the mechanics of the videotape room. The uh, picture you have on the monitor at the present time is our switching control center. It's located physically in the tape room and used primarily to start the machines with this switcher right here. They're individually selective and can be assigned to any stage as well as being started in any group from the room itself. We have a switch system here for putting any number of machines on a particular bus. Number one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, down through, we'll now start with this red button. Now, if I put these switches in the downward position, it goes to a different function. We have now a possibility of controlling from either this switch or seven other positions on these rotary switches, which are the various stages here at the center. The center position being an off position, which still allows the operator on the machine to start the machines locally, but takes away the remote control or the remote start feature. I might add that at the uh, time we have these machines set up for remote start from a stage or from this panel. The operator at all times has control of the machines at the machine. He can set his own levels, he can start the machines and stop them. We do not believe in a remote stop on these machines, therefore we have left it out of the entire system. We further uh, do not use the remote record position. All record function is performed by the operator assigned to the machines. So much for the start switcher and start designation. We have the Tektronic 525 <coughs> scope that's on the line to look at any individual picture that might be coming in the waveform of the picture, that is, as well as the Conrack monitor for video check. We can select any of the feeds that are available to us. We have a feed from Master Control, a spare feed from Master Control. We have a net direct feed, a feed from Studio A, B, the E line that I'm using right at the present time, and also an air feed and two lines set up on patch cords so that this monitor can be used as well as the waveform for selecting any type or video presentation that we wish to check. This is very handy during the day if uh, a service on a particular line should fail we can immediately check, find where it can be restored and then accomplish the switching on the machines with these other switchers over here. This bank of switchers is set up so that one switcher feeds each machine. This top switcher is machine number one, machine number one, and so on, on down. <clears throat> we have the identical feeds on all the buttons of these switchers, as you saw, on the preview switcher. In addition to the eight machines which we have at present, we have one more switcher for feeding kinescope, which is in the next room. The racks here 
contain the distribution amplifiers for all the various functions that you have just seen on these switchers. In other words, everything comes in to a DA in the video tape department, and it's fed through our switchers and individually fed to all eight machines. In addition, we have our own patch bay for video. Should possibly a switcher go bad for a particular machine, we can pick up a feed from a DA and go direct into the machine by pulling out its normal and setting up the proper patch. We have the similar setup on the audio. Our own audio patch bay, individual amplifiers for the various feeds that appear on the switcher, and the availability of other feeds should one fail. Now, right below the switcher, I don't know whether it's visible or not. Let's see here. No, you can't see it. It's below the machine here. We have the remote gain controls for the machines. We have remote video, pedestal, and sync for each individual machine. When we go to remote operation with the various gain, pedestal, and sync controls, it does take it away from the machine, but that is the only function that the remote removes from the operator. He has full control of the machines at all time, except when on remote, he does not have his video, pedestal, and sync controls. They are on this panel at the front for the supervisor to operate. Now we have uh, arranged our machines in a configuration of four in a group. We operate the machines in pairs. This machine I have my hand on is number one. Facing it is number two. The racks along the wall are the associated video gear for these two machines. In normal operation, we would use one and two simultaneously on the same program. That is, we would take one machine for air copy and the other machine for protection. When we record, we start both these machines at the same time by delegating the two machines we want to start onto the switcher. We start the machines. The operator then places the machines in the record mode. The machines record the entire program. <coughs> Oh, I might add one thing. We have a tone which we apply to the tape at seven seconds of straight up for purposes of start cue. In other words, this clock we use, it's very carefully set each day. We start our tone at 15 seconds of the hour by means of this lever switch. This tone runs continually then until seven seconds of the hour. The tone is released, and we have seven seconds of silence before the programming starts at straight up. Now in playback, we cue up to the end of that tone. When we have reached the end of the tone and very carefully set the machine, the machines are started, the picture will appear in seven seconds. That is, of course, if the network's on time. Now, as I've explained, we use the two machines in conjunction with each program, one for air and one for protection. The machines are started up simultaneously on playback. Now, uh, as yet, the machines do not start at exactly the same rate of speed. Therefore, there may be a difference of a quarter of a second in time between the two machines when the picture comes up to speed. Therefore, it's necessary for the operator to check the protection machine and either run it forward or back to synchronize perfectly with the machine that's on the air. That's necessary so that the operational director and the technical director in the studio that the program is being fed through may always have a duplicate picture to go to in case something should happen with the machines. And it does happen occasionally. We try to keep 
machine troubles to a minimum, but it's not always possible to have the machines in tip-top condition. A tube replaced this morning may go out this afternoon, as you all probably know. The uh, machines are laid out in this configuration. Number one, for convenience, and number two, this is all the space we had to put them in. Now, I'll come back uh, through the room a little bit, and I'll point out a few items that might possibly be of interest to you. We have the speakers for the individual machines mounted on the tops of the racks facing each other. For an operator to synchronize his machines, he need only stand in the middle, turn up the audio enough on each machine so that he can hear it, and very perfectly synchronize two audio on the machines. That's the reason for the speakers facing one another. Another reason for the speakers to face this direction is to keep down ambient room noise. And it gets pretty rough at times. As a matter of convenience, we have certain tools which we install on each of the machines. One is a socket wrench used for removing the bolts which hold the head in place. Very handy to have this wrench on the machine in case you need to replace a head in a hurry. That sometimes happens. We also have certain Allen wrenches which are used in making adjustments and to remove or install certain parts of the machine. We have a cleaning solution which we use to remove the oxide, the uh, certain collection of dirt that collects on the machines. When the tape operates through the machine, oxide peels and it builds up on the audio heads. It also builds up on the video heads. Therefore, it's necessary to keep these items very clean. A buildup of oxide on the audio head or video head can cause a serious interruption of program material. Therefore, it is our policy to clean all parts of the machine, including the capstan, the heads, and the drives, each time the machine is put into operation, whether it be for record or playback. These lights that you see are not used in their normal condition at the present time. They're normally turned down over the machines for operating. We need a little light in here to do this pickup, so put some big bulbs in them and point them at the ceiling. As I mentioned earlier, the racks contain the gear which runs the machines. To operate this particular machine, we have first the rack which contains the Conrack video monitor, the 525 waveform amplifier, which is a Tektronic scope, the audio amplifier for monitor purposes. The next rack contains power supplies, the master control unit, the captain servo unit. The next rack over associated with this machine contains the power supplies, blanking switcher, switcher, Modulator, demodulator, process amplifier, and the auto comp mechanism. Now we have here labels which are used on the machines, or on the tapes rather, to identify each roll of tape. This label contains important information. The name of the program, the show number, the machine recorded on, the initial of the engineer recording the show <clears throat> so that we can check back at a future date and find out what possibly happened during the time of recording. The recording date of the show, the playback date, which is very important. The physical tape number of the tape itself. We assign a number to each reel of tape. When it comes in and is evaluated, we assign a number to it. That number also goes on the reel or on the label. And this stays with the tape until it's erased. I'll pass around some of these labels so that you can see what 
we do with them. This reel that you see on the racks is very important also. That is our standard tip projection tape. That contains information recorded at proper tip projection, so the machines may be set to the identical tip projection each time. It contains a proper control track level. It contains an audio tone of the proper recorded level for a fast check on your machines. It's an invaluable piece to have with your machines when you're trying to set up standards so that everything you make will be identical. I'm going to move to the back of the room and show you a little of the editing procedures we use and uh, possibly illustrate a little better some of the operation of the machine. We'll make a tape cut on this because it's easier than trying to drag another camera in. So we'll beat you in the back of the room. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> we have here two of our editors at work. We have Dick Wilson, who is marking the tape, and Ray Darby, who is doing the splicing. Now, uh, Dick Wilson is locating and marking the spots for editing. He is working from the tail of the show toward the head. He's making his marks for editing purposes. And he'll pass the tape across to Ray Darby, who will actually make the physical cut. <clears throat> now, Dick, would you like to uh, mention anything about what you're doing here? I'm editing a show that needs pieces put together on another assembly. Right now, I'm finding a place to mark the front of a cut. I'll find that and show you how it goes here. We watch the picture and listen to the audio both on this particular one. I found the spot to cut now. I mark it with an ink pen. At the front of this piece, I put a white spotter and give a little slack. And we pass this roll in, which has a mark at the tail end and at the front end, over to Ray. In order to make it easy for him, I'll run it forward on another reel. So all he has to do on the splicer is to go to the mark at the rear of the cut and make his splice to the assembly. It saves him hand winding over there and unloading his machine. I can do it much faster on the Ampex. I can mark a little faster than he can edit, so this saves him quite a bit of time. This is the next piece he needs. I might add at this time that we normally do not operate the machines without the covers. However, the editors have found that it's much faster to operate for editing and marking purposes with the covers removed. So they take them off, do their marking and editing, and then the covers put back on for normal operations. I'm cutting pieces, I'm cutting pieces out of this particular show, which are to be inserted in another assembly. This show had some defects in the recorded material between these pieces, so I'm finding special pieces by a Q-script here. I'll run up to the next spot I need. This is the end of the cut I need, so I make my mark. Let me point out this mark, Dick. I don't think that they can see it. Uh, does that show up, now? No, no, uh, no. Pick that light up again. That's it. Light How's that? Now, there's the mark he just made. That's a mark for a video cut that I'm making. A lot of this cutting depends a lot on feel and the experience of the editor. I've made the mark. I've put a tab on over here at the left side, which is merely an indicator for me or for Ray. Uh, 
that were near a place to cut. I'm going to the front now and find another spot. I might mention that this knee switch down here, can you see this switch? This switch releases the brakes when I hit it with my leg. It makes it very easy to move the machine and it is very easy to operate. In this particular cut, I'm marking a, an audio cut and we'll cut this in on audio into the other assembly. He's marking the audio now. This you can't see because of the fact that the shield is in the way. But here is your mark now that was made right at the audio head. You see that now? Yeah. Now that's the audio cut point. Just for the purpose of demonstration, do you think you can make a larger one? Well, the question was brought up about making a larger mark for demonstration purposes. So Dick will do that. Yeah, that's good. I'll put an A with it. So this, uh, the A indicates audio. Now on the back side of the tape, for the editor's benefit, the splicer needs a mark on the oxide side. So I mark the back side. These are very critical cuts on some of these audio ones, and we come as close as we can. Now again, I pass this tape over to Ray after I get it tail end out. He rewinds the tape to uh, get a tail end out because it's more convenient on the splicer since he's operating from the tail toward head. All the cuts are in proper physical sequence in that fashion. You'll have to excuse the noise going on here while we're making this recording, but it's very difficult to find a time in the videotape room with only eight machines when Practically all eight machines aren't in complete 100% usage. All right, now uh, we've shown how the tape is marked and passed across to Ray Darby, who is making the editing splices. Before we go over to uh, Ray there, I think that I will show you a little bit about one of these machines, how the vacuum pump is located or where it's located, where you would optimize the machine, and uh, a few things that uh, it won't be possible to show you when you file through the tape department. This machine right here, incidentally, is recording the show, recording the tape that uh, you are now looking at. I'll remove this cover. <laughs> now, I think you can see rather well the vacuum system. This is the vacuum pump right here. My hand is on. This is the vacuum cleaner, which removes surplus oxide and dust and dirt from the video head while you're recording or playing back. We have here, in this other large gray box, a blower. It's a dual centrifugal blower, and through these hoses, it forces a blast of cold air through the electronic parts of the machine so that they just don't melt. The temperature inside this console would go to a fantastic value were it not for the blower that we have built in. The air is drawn up from the floor, the cool air, through a filter, and then circulated throughout the machine. This is the switch that Dick Wilson was pointing out to you before. We've installed this switch on our machines to release the electronic or the electric brakes on the take up and hold back. This is a great aid in editing because it allows the tape to be worked back and forth for finding cues without the strain that there would be where the brake's on. This is the driver amplifier. 
And these are the controls used for optimizing the individual channels on the head. I'm going to have Gene Biskiart remove the left-hand control panel and show you the simplicity of getting at these machines for service. Go ahead, Gene. Let's take the bezel off. The Model Bs have two latches, which are operated by finger pressure, and the left and right hand control panels slide out on tracks. Makes it very, very easy to get at. As I say, we're recording on this particular machine, and if we're lucky, it'll still be operating when we get the panel out. is out for service. As you can see, it would be very easy to work on this particular amplifier. All the tubes are available in this section. The electronic components are available on the back side. Very easy to get at. This left-hand control panel contains our scope for checking operation of the machine, head stability, and so forth. As you can see on the screen. There is the listen you pattern, which indicates that the machine is stable. Where that pattern to rotate, flip and flop would indicate that our head drum was not locked, not synchronized, and our recording would in all probab probability be loused up. On playback, we have a control mark tracking. That's to permit the head to right down the recorded track, dead center, and not off to one side or the other. It's nothing but a phase shift network, which causes the tape to either ride forward slightly or back slightly in time in relation to the head rotation. <clears throat> we have a switch for checking the record currents on the individual channels. We're looking at head number one now. Nev, if you'll pan up. I'll point out the meter here. I don't know whether we can get in tight enough to see this or not. This meter right over here, I guess you can see that on the screen, indicates the current on the various heads during record. You can see the meter change as I switch through the different heads. That uh, calibration on that meter is not critical. It, it really uh, is only an indication that you are getting record current to the heads. This knob right here is the tip projection knob. That controls the servo motor, which causes the female guide block to move the tape toward the head or away from the, from the head to change tip projection. This is very handy in playing back foreign tapes. By foreign tapes, I mean tapes recorded outside of the local plant, where the tip projection might be a little different. We can merely turn that control and take out the skewing manually. Okay, Gene, we'll just drop this back in. Thank you, Gene. I think we've covered uh, just about all that you could possibly see on the machine now with the camera. The right-hand control panel is essentially the same as the left, except for the fact that it controls all the audio gear. That is the audio record amplifiers, the bias amplifiers, playback amplifiers, and so forth. And all your stop and start functions are on this right-hand control panel. The light that you see right here is the record indicator, which shows that we are recording on this machine. I think that that will just about cover uh, the physical aspects of the machine. Now we'll move around to Ray Darby, who is making the physical video cuts on the tape for editing purposes. We're now back with Ray Darby, who is taking the tape that you saw passed across, and he will develop 
with the carbonyl iron solution. Find the edit pulses and make the physical splice on the s and splicer. Don't be nervous, Ray. <laughs> This uh, bottle that Ray has is merely a plastic bottle with a siphon tube. The carbonyl iron is mixed with a diluent, a lacquer diluent, and mixed well to suspend the carbonyl iron particles. Then as he squeezes this bottle, it forces the solution out across the tape. The magnetized portions of the tape cause the carbonyl iron to adhere and therefore presents an actual picture of the recorded information. Now he's trimming the edges of the excess splicing tape with scissors. It's possible to do it with a little jig and a knife on the splicer but the editors here prefer to use the scissors. Wiping off the excess oxide that was put on for development purposes and that splice is now ready to be run through the machine. <coughs> now he's ready to join the next segment we passed across. We'll follow exactly the same procedure. Makes a rough cut with the scissors just to remove the excess tape. you hear in the background are due to Dick Wilson locating audio cues. It gets pretty noisy down here from time to time in the editing. See, he's going through the same procedure as before. Make his splices. And one more splice is completed except for the edge trimming. As you can see, the editing goes quite rapidly, particularly with two men working on the show. One man doing the marking and the other doing the physical splicing. It goes right along, just one, two, three. Now, Nev, let's take a shot of the room again here. And uh, I think this will conclude the pictures from the videotape room. I see that our uh, maintenance work for this morning is uh, picking up, so I think we'll call this uh, 
quits on a recording from here this morning. I'll be very happy to answer any questions you might have. I will bring a tote board up. I don't know whether uh, you can see the board up there now. It's up over the switchers. It contains the chipboard for daily operations. That's machine assignments, more or less. Gene Biskiart's going to lift that board down and bring it back to us so that you can see a little bit better what we have. And uh, I'll bring one of them up to the lecture so that you can see. The board is made out. Let's go this way a little bit. There we go. The board is made out in hours across the top. We have room for eight machines on this board. We have shows indicated in red for recording and in blue for playback. This is a representative schedule for Tuesday. Recording and playback times. As I say, I'll bring this board up, show you a little bit better what it is. Very convenient to have up above the switcher for getting your machines and shows started on time. Well, this concludes the portion from the videotape room. As I say, I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. This has been an ABC videotape edited production. Audio and video effects were not mechanically reproduced.